the Clement Voroshilov tanks were a series of Soviet heavy tanks named after the Soviet defense commissar and politician Clement Voroshilov and used by the Red Army during World War II. The KV series were known for their extremely heavy armor protection during the early part of the war, especially during the first year of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. They were almost completely immune to the 3.7 cm KWK-36 and howitzer like short-barreled 7.5 cm KWK-37 guns mounted respectively on the early Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks fielded by the invading German forces. Until better guns were developed by the Germans it was often the case that the only way to defeat a KV was with a point-blank shot to the rear. Prior to Operation Barbarossa, about 500 of the over 22,000 tanks then in Soviet service were of the KV-1 type. When the KV-1 appeared, it outclassed the French Char B-1, the only other heavy tank in operational service in the world at the time. Yet, in the end, it turned out that there was little sense in producing the expensive KV tanks, as the T-34 medium tank performed better in all practical respects. Later in the war, the KV series became a base for the development of the IS series of tanks. Development history, after disappointing results with the multi-turreted T-35 heavy tank, Soviet tank designers started drawing up replacements. The T-35 conformed to the 1920s notion of a breakthrough tank with very heavy firepower and armor protection, but suffered from poor mobility. The Spanish Civil War demonstrated the need for much heavier armor on tanks, and was the main influence on Soviet tank design just prior to World War II. The doctrine of Soviet deep battle called for the existence of relatively immobile, but heavily fortified, siege tanks that were supposed to keep pressure on enemy troops during the siege phase. Thus, the requirements for KV-1 were heavily skewed towards a potentially not so agile, but heavy tank that was supposed to dominate the field. Several competing designs were offered, and even more were drawn up prior to reaching prototype stage. All had heavy armor, torsion bar suspension, wide tracks, and were of welded and cast construction. One of the main competing designs was the SMK, which in its final form had two turrets, mounting the same combination of 76.2mm and 45mm weapons. The designers of the SMK independently drew up a single turreted variant and this received approval at the highest level. Two of these, named after the People's Defense Commissioner were ordered alongside a single SMK. The smaller hull and single turret enabled the designer to install heavy frontal and turret armor while keeping the weight within manageable limits. When the Soviets entered the Winter War, the SMK, KV and the third design, the T-100 was sent to be tested in combat conditions. The KV outperformed the SMK and T-100 designs. The KV's heavy armor proved highly resistant to Finnish anti-tank weapons, making it more difficult to stop. In 1939, the production of 50 KVs was ordered. During the war, the Soviets found it difficult to deal with the concrete bunkers used by the Finns and a request was made for a tank with a large howitzer. One of the rush projects to meet the request put the howitzer in a new turret on one of the KV tanks. Initially known as Little Turret and Big Turret, the 76mm armed tank was designated as the KV-1 heavy tank and the 152mm howitzer 1 as KV-2 heavy artillery tank. The KV's strengths included armor that was impenetrable by any tank-mounted weapon then in service except at point-blank range, that it had good firepower, and that it had good traction on soft ground. It also had serious flaws, it was difficult to steer, the transmission was unreliable, and the ergonomics were poor, with limited visibility and no turret basket. Furthermore, at 45 tons, it was simply too heavy. This severely impacted the maneuverability, not so much in terms of maximum speed, as through inability to cross many bridges medium tanks could cross. The KV outweighed most other tanks of the era, being about twice as heavy as the heaviest contemporary German tank. KVs were never equipped with a snorkeling system to ford shallow rivers, so they had to be left to travel to an adequate bridge. As applique armor and other improvements were added without increasing engine power, later models were less capable of keeping up to speed with medium tanks and had more trouble with difficult terrain. 
In addition, its firepower was no better than the T-34. It took field reports from senior commanders, and certified heroes, who could be honest without risk of punishment, to reveal, what a dog the KV-1 really was. While initially the Soviets made a lot of poor defense decisions, worsened by recent cleansings of Soviet military command, the KV-1 was unlike anything the German army had expected to encounter, and some of the battles against numerically superior Axis forces became legendary. Even though the operations of the KV family of tanks were severely hampered by restrictions due to its weight, it was a fearsome and formidable weapon through most of the Second World War. Further development, by 1942, when the Germans were fielding large numbers of long-barreled 50mm and 75mm guns, the KV's armor was no longer invincible. The KV-1 side, top, and turret armor could also be penetrated by the high-velocity Mk-101 carried by German ground-attack aircraft, such as the Henschel HS-129, requiring the installation of additional field expedient to pick a copyright armor. The KV-1 76.2mm gun also came in for criticism. While adequate against all German tanks, it was the same gun as carried by smaller, faster, and cheaper T-34 medium tanks. In 1943, it was determined that this gun could not penetrate the frontal armor of the new Tiger, the first German heavy tank, fortuitously captured near Leningrad. The KV-1 was also much more difficult to manufacture and thus more expensive than the T-34. In short, its advantages no longer outweighed its drawbacks. Nonetheless, because of its initial superior performance, the KV-1 was chosen as one of the few tanks to continue being built following the Soviet reorganization of tank production. Due to the new standardization, it shared the similar engine and gun as the T-34, was built in large quantities, and received frequent upgrades. When production shifted to the Ural Mountains Tankograd complex, the KV-2 was dropped. While impressive on paper, it had been designed as a slow-moving bunker buster. It was less useful in highly mobile, fluid warfare that developed in World War II. The turret was so heavy it was difficult to traverse on uneven terrain. Finally, it was expensive to produce. Only about 300 KV-2s were made, all in 1940-41, making it one of the rarer Soviet tanks. As the war continued, the KV-1 continued to get more armor to compensate for the increasing effectiveness of German weapons. This culminated in the KV-1 model 1942, which had very heavy armor, but lacked a corresponding improvement to the engine. Tankers complained that, although they were well protected, their mobility was poor and they had no firepower advantage over the T-34 medium tank. In response to criticisms, the lighter KV-1S was released, with thinner armor and a smaller, lower turret in order to reclaim some speed. Importantly, the KV-1S also had a commander's cupola with all-around vision blocks, a first for a Soviet heavy tank. However, the thinning out of the armor called into question why the tank was being produced at all, when the T-34 could seemingly do everything the KV could do and much more cheaply. The Soviet heavy tank program was close to cancellation in mid-1943. The appearance of the German Panther tank in the summer of 1943 convinced the Red Army to make a serious upgrade of its tank force for the first time since 1941. Soviet tanks needed bigger guns to take on the growing numbers of Panthers and the few Tigers. A stopgap upgrade to the KV series was the short-lived KV-85 or Object 239. This was a KV-1S with a new turret designed for the IS-85 mounting the same 85mm D5T gun as the Su-85 and early versions of the T-34-85. Demand for the gun slowed production of the KV-85 tremendously and only 148 were built before the KV design was replaced. The KV-85 was produced in the autumn and winter of 1943-44. They were sent to the front as of September 1943 and production of the KV-85 was stopped by the spring of 1944 once the IS-2 entered full-scale production. Successor, a new heavy tank design entered production late in 1943 based on the work done on the KV-13. Because Clement Voroshilov had fallen out of political favor, 
the new heavy tank series was named the Joseph Stalin tank, after Joseph Stalin. The KV-13 programs AS-85 prototype was accepted for production as the AS-1 heavy tank. After testing with both 100mm and 122mm guns, the D-25T 122mm gun was selected as the main armament of the new tank, primarily because of his ready availability and the effect of its large high explosive shell when attacking German fortifications. The 122mm D25T used a separate shell and powder charge, resulting in a lower rate of fire and reduced ammunition capacity. While the 122mm armor-piercing shell had a lower muzzle velocity than similar late German 7.5cm and 8.8cm guns, proving ground tests showed that the 122mm AP shell could defeat the frontal armor of the German Panther tank and the HE shell would easily blow off the drive sprocket and tread of the heaviest German tank or self-propelled gun. The IS-122 replaced the IS-85, and began mass production as the IS-2. The 85 arm gun saw service in the lighter Su-85 and T-34-85. Models, the Soviets did not recognize different production models of KV-1 during the war. Designations like Model 1939 were introduced later in military publications. These designations, however, are not strict and describe leading changes, while other changes might be adapted earlier or later in specific production batches. Designations like KV-1A were applied by the Germans during the war. KV-1, Model 1939 a Euro first production models, these tanks were prone to frequent breakdowns but were highly resistant to anti-tank weapons during the Winter War. These tanks were armed with a 76mm 11 tank gun, recognizable due to a recuperator above a barrel. Most tanks were lacking the hull machine gun. 141 were built. Model 1940 a Euro used the F-32 76mm gun and a new mantlet. The main production model by the time of the German invasion. Model 1940 Essek Renami or KV-1EA Euro with additional bolted on applica copyright armor and F-32 gun. Model 1941 Euro op armored with 25 to 35 arm added to the turret, hull front and sides. Turret was now cast instead of welded. This tank was armed with the longer barreled F-34, and later ZIS-5 76.2 arm tank guns. Model 1942 a Euro fully cast turret with thicker armor or welded turret with thicker armor, again up armored and used an improved engine and the 76 ohm ZIS-5 tank gun. KV-1 SA Euro a lighter variant of late 1942 with higher speed, but thinner armor. A new, smaller, cast turret and redesigned rear hull were used. 1370 were built. Panzer Camp Wage and KVIA 753, R, and Panzer Camp Wage and KVIB 755, R, the KV-1 in German service. Some were fitted with a high-velocity KWK 40L-4375 mm gun, the same gun used in a Panzer 4A USFF-2. All tanks in the series were heavily based on the KV-1 technology. KV-2 a Euro A heavy assault tank with the M10 152 mm howitzer, the KV-2 was produced at the same time as the KV-1. Due to the size of its heavy turret and gun, the KV-2 was slower and had a much higher profile than the KV-1. Those captured and used by the German army were known as Panzerkampfwagen KVII 754-R, and often used for artillery observation due to its height, TH sent 150, experimental tank based on KV-1. Armor 90 mm, weight, 51 tons. New 700 HP engine. Turret had a cupola but was in all other ways identical to the turret of the KV-1. One prototype was constructed in 1941 and was destroyed defending Leningrad. KV-3, experimental tanks based on KV-1. Longer chassis. The first design was never built, but it was supposed to have an 85 mm gun. The same thing happened to Object 222, but it was supposed to have a F-32 76.2 mm gun. The Objects 221 and 222 both used a new modified KV-1 turret. 
Object 223's hull was built and was tested with weights to simulate the new conical turret that was designed for it. Object 223 had up to 120 mm of sloped armor. Series production was intended to start in late 1941, but the German invasion of Russia halted these plans and the only prototype hull was destroyed. KV-4, a project for a super-heavy tank. About 20 different designs were proposed, but it was cancelled due to the outbreak of the war. Different versions would have been between about 85 and 110 tons. Armor from about 120 to 190 um. Armament 107 mm ZIS-6 cannon. Different variants had various auxiliary weapons, 45 mm, 76 mm cannons, machine guns and flamethrowers in addition to their main gun. KV-5, a cancelled project for a super heavy tank. Armament was to be a 107 ohm ZIS-6 gun in a large turret and machine gun in a small secondary turret. Weight was projected as about 100 tons, and the tank was to have 150 to 180 mm of armor. Project development began in June 1941, however was cancelled due to the siege of Leningrad, when all developmental operations at the Kirov plant were halted. The project fell out of favor from the more advanced heavy tank designs, and no prototype was built. KV-6, according to an order to the Chelyabinsk tractor factory in June 1941, the tank indexed KV-6 was to be designed from the KV-1 with 90 mm of armor and a 76 mm gun model 1940. Nothing ever came of this design. KV-7 Experimental self-propelled gun based on KV-1 armed with three cannons, two 45mm model 1932-34 and one 76mm F-34. 200 rounds of ammunition was carried for the 45mm guns and 93 rounds for the 75mm gun, and the tank had 100mm of frontal armor. One unit was produced and tested in 1941. KV-7-2 also called U-14, had two 76mm F-34 cannons, and 85mm of frontal armor. Vehicles were not taken in service primarily because they could not fight tanks and they could not combat concrete bunkers due to the small caliber of the guns. After the failure of the KV-7 it was decided to put one 152mm gun in the casemate instead of their smaller guns. This led to the development of the Su-152. U-18, experimental self-propelled gun. KV-7 armed with 152mm ML-20 howitzer. Vehicle was projected in 1941. Wooden mock-up was constructed. Project was cancelled, but this vehicle was a first step towards Su-152 design. U-19, experimental self-propelled gun armed with 203mm B-4 cannon. The vehicle was to have 75 mm of frontal armor, 60 mm on the side, and the roof was to be 30 mm. It was projected to weigh 66 tons, but the project was not very successful and was cancelled within a year. SU-152, CSU-152. ZIK-20, the ZIK-20 was very similar to the U-19, but had 105 mm of frontal armor, and 75 mm of side armor and was to mount a milliliter-20 gun. By the time was wooden mock-up was made the KV-1 was phased out of production. However just before the project was cancelled a blueprint was drawn up to equip the ZIK-20 with a BO-2 152.4 mm gun. And to offset the weight the frontal armor was to be reduced to 75 mm, SU-203, SU-152 equipped with 203mm M4 mortar, the SU-203 was never built. KV-8 a Euro a KV-1 fitted with the ATO-41 flamethrower in the turret, beside a machine gun. In order to accommodate the new weapon, the 76.2mm gun was replaced with a smaller 45mm gun M1932, though it was disguised to look like the standard 76mm. KV-8 SA Euro the same as KV-8, but based on KV-1S. Was equipped with ATO-42 flamethrower. KV-8M, upgraded version of KV-8S. Was equipped with two flamethrowers. 
Two prototypes were constructed. KV-9, a KV-1 with short 122mm U11 cannon. One prototype was constructed and proved in 1941. KV-10, also known as KV-1KA KV-1 with four rocket launchers on the sides of hull. Each launcher contained two 132mm M13 rockets. Early variant of KV-1K had two launchers on the back of hull, each contained six rockets. One prototype was constructed and tested in 1942. Not taken in service. KV-11, KV-1 armed with 85mm F-30 cannon. Projected in 1942. Not built. KV-12, experimental chemical tank. Was equipped with four external toxin tanks on the back of chassis. Tanks surrounded with 30mm armor. Not taken in service. KV-13, prototype of a medium tank. Designation for an advanced redesign of the KV series, which was resulted in the production of the IS series. IS Model 2, a KV-13, with turret and armament from KV-9. One prototype was constructed and proved in 1943. Tank had lost competition to IS Model 1 and was not taken in service. KV-14 a Euro prototype designation for a 152mm self-propelled gun, accepted for service as the SU-152. KV-85 a Euro a KV-1S with the 85mm D5T cannon in a new turret, with the ball-mounted hull machine gun removed and the hull welded shut, 148 of these tanks were produced in the second half of 1943 until the spring of 1944. They were a stopgap until the IS tank series entered production. This tank had its original turret, but later models were equipped with IS-1 turret. KV-85G, KV-1S with 85mm S-31 cannon. Turret and mantlet remained from conventional KV-1S. This variant was a competitor of KV-85 during proving. It lost the competition and was not taken in service. KV-122, a KV-1S with short 122mm S-41 howitzer. One prototype was made in 1943. Not taken in service. KV-100, a KV-85 with a 100mm S-34 cannon. One prototype was made in 1944. Not taken in service. KV-122, a KV-85 with a 122mm D-25T cannon. One prototype was made in 1944. Not taken in service. KV-220, experimental tank based on KV-1. Longer chassis. Armor, 100mm. New 850HP V2SN engine with turbocharging. New diamond-shaped turret. 85mm F-30 cannon. One prototype was constructed in 1941. It was destroyed. KV and other heavy Soviet tanks compared, combat history, Raz and I. I. When Operation Barbarossa began, the Red Army was equipped with 508 new KV tanks. So effective was its armor that the Germans were incapable of destroying it with their tanks or anti-tank weapons and had to rely on 88mm anti-aircraft guns or 105mm guns to knock them out. Only a few of these tanks were used to good effect, but one event of the Battle of Razenai was a notable example. On 23 Euro June 24, a single KV-2 effectively pinned down elements of the 6th Panzer Division a Euro the spearhead of Panzergruppe for a Euro for a full day at the bridgeheads of the Duwisa River near Razenai, Lithuania, playing a prominent role in delaying the German advance on Leningrad and destroying around two dozen German tanks. Krisnogvidiusk, on August 14, 1941, the vanguard of the German 8th Panzer Division approached Krisnogvidiusk near Leningrad, and the only Soviet force available at the time to attempt to stop the German advance consisted of five well-hidden KV-1 tanks, dug in within a grove at the edge of a swamp. KV-1 tank number 864 was commanded by the leader of this small force, Lieutenant Zinovy Kolobanov. German forces attacked Krasnogvidiysk from three directions. Near Novoyurchka's settlement the geography favored the Soviet defenders as the only road in the region past the swamp, 
and the defenders commanded this choke point from their hidden position. Lieutenant Kolobanov had carefully studied the situation and readied his detachment the day before. Each KV-1 tank carried twice the normal amount of ammunition, two-thirds of which were armor-piercing rounds. Kolobanov ordered his other commanders to hold their fire and await orders. He did not want to reveal the total force, so only one tank would expose itself at a time and engage the enemy. On August 14, the German 8th Panzer Division's vanguard ventured directly into the well-prepared Soviet ambush. Kolobanov's tank knocked out the lead German tank with its first shot. The Germans falsely assumed that their lead tank had hit an anti-tank mine, and failed to realize that they had been ambushed. The German column stopped, giving Kolobanov the opportunity to destroy the second tank. Only then did the Germans realize they were under attack, but they failed to find the source of the shots. While the German tanks were firing blindly, Kolobanov knocked out the trailing German tank, thus boxing in the entire column. Although the Germans correctly guessed the direction of fire, they could only spot Lieutenant Kolobanov's tank, and now attempted to engage an unseen enemy. German tanks moving off the road bogged down in the surrounding soft ground, becoming easy targets. Twenty-two German tanks and two towed artillery pieces fell victim to Kolobanov's tank before it ran out of ammunition. Kolobanov ordered in another KV-1, and 21 more German tanks were destroyed before the half-hour battle ended. A total of 43 German tanks were destroyed by just five Soviet KV-1s. After the battle, the crew of No. 865 counted a total of 135 hits on their tank, none of which had penetrated the armor. Lieutenant Kolobanov was awarded the Order of Lenin, while his driver Yusuf was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. Later on, former Captain Zinovy Kolobanov was again decorated by Soviet authorities, despite having been convicted and downgraded after the Winter War for fraternizing with the enemy. After the end of World War II, Lieutenant Kolobanov served in the Soviet occupation zone in East Germany, where he was convicted again when a subordinate escaped to the British occupation zone, and was transferred to the reserves. The battle for Krasnogvidiusk was covered up by Soviet propaganda. A monument dedicated to this battle was installed in the village of Novoyurchkas in 1980, at the place where Kolobanov's KV-1 was dug in, due solely to the demands of the villagers. Unfortunately it was impossible to find a KV-1 tank, so an S-2 heavy tank was installed there instead. The Soviet victory was the result of a well-planned ambush in advantageous ground and of technical superiority. Most of the German tanks in this battle were Panzer IIs, armed with 20 on guns, and a few Panzer IIs armed with 37mm KWK 36L-46.5 guns. The German tank guns had neither the range nor the power of the 76L main gun of a KV-1, and the narrower track width of the German tanks caused them to become trapped in the swampy ground. Some KVs remained in service right up to the end of the war, although in greatly diminishing numbers as they wore out or were knocked out. The 260th Guards Heavy Breakthrough Tank Regiment, based on the Leningrad Front, operated a number of 1941 vintage KV-1s at least as late as the summer of 1944 before re-equipping with Istrus. A regiment of KVs saw service in Manchuria in August 1945, and a few KV-85s were used in the Crimea in the summer of 1944. The Finnish forces had two KVs, nicknamed Klimai, a Model 1940 and Model 1941, both of which received minor upgrades in their service, and both of which survived the war. See also Yosef Stalin tank, comparison of early World War II tanks, March of the Soviet Tankmen, notes. References External links, on war specifications, KV-1M39, KV-1EM40, KV-1M41, KV-1S, KV-85, KV-2, Russian Battlefield, KV-1, KV-1S, KV-2, KV-8 and KV-8S, KV-85, KV-3, KV-4, KV-5, KV-7, KV-9 and KV-220, Soviet Heavy Tanks Specification, World War II Vehicles, Walk around KV-85 from Avtovo, St. Petersburg, 
KV tanks, KV tanks in museum and monuments, KV-2 test drive.